this is going to be one of those sermons that uh, probably a lot of people in the room are going to feel really good about, and then there's going to be a few people in the room that are going to leave um, and hopefully not feel beat up on, uh, because that is not the goal at all. Um, I do want us today to hear the truth of the Word of God, to be confronted by the truth of the Word of God, but to be encouraged uh, by what God has for us. Uh, Students, uh, this sermon uh, was written uh, a lot with you all in mind. Uh, Not yet married folks, uh, you need to hear this truth today. Uh, For those of you who are married, I hope that some of what you hear today uh, will be encouraging and challenging to you as well. And that as we leave, we'll leave um, knowing that God has spoken to us today. We're going to read Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. We are learning about uh, the life of Samson and some of the mistakes of Samson. Today we're talking about the impulsive and unteachable side of Samson. And we're going to learn about some tendencies and even some uh, potential problems in our own lives. uh, And hopefully we will learn and grow, and at the end of the day, be able to rejoice together in uh, God and in His Word. So, uh, if you're willing and able, I want to invite you to stand with me as we read Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, uh, the story of Samson and uh, uh, his first problem with women. It's just what it is. It says, uh, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go take the wife from the uncircumcised Philistine? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistine. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Let's pray. Father, we bow before your word. We um, thank you for your word. Uh, And God, I pray that your word would speak today and that my word would not. I pray, Father, that you would hear uh, uh, the praises of your children and that we would hear the instruction of our God, and that, Father, we would honor you in the things that we think and in the ways that we respond to your word today. I pray, Father, that you would move me uh, out of the way, that you would would give me words to speak, and that if I prepared words that don't need to be said, you would block them from my mind, from my eyes, and that you would speak through me, Father, your word to your people. God, I love you, and I love this people. I pray your blessings over us today as we study your word. I pray that you would speak to us, challenge us, shape us, mold us to become more like you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This story is hugely important. If you'll follow along uh, on your outline if you want to, and on uh, the back of your bulletin, first thing, Samson meets a Philistine girl. Uh, Samson meets a Philistine girl. I have nothing, Tracy, I don't think. So Samson met this Philistine girl. He's in Timnah, deep in Israelite territory. This was not a Philistine town necessarily, but there were Philistines who were living there. So the Philistines have have kind of conquered and taken over uh, Israel. Uh, They've begun living in Israelite territory, and Timnah is one of those places. Even though the Philistines are enemies, and even though they're oppressing the Israelites, the Israelites seem pretty comfortable around the Philistines, and the Philistines seem pretty comfortable around the Israelites. But sin does that to us. It makes us friends with things that really should be enemies, and it leads us to make compromises. The Israelites seem pretty okay with it. Even to the extent that Samson now wants to marry this Philistine girl. Now remember, if you were here last week, if you weren't, really in chapter 13 what we learned was that Samson is supposed to be freeing the Israelites from the Philistines, not marrying them. 
And so we have a major problem going on. I think you probably realize it, but it's worth saying. It's really hard to defeat a sin or a habit that you become extraordinarily committed to. Uh, when you get married to your sin, it makes it hard to break up. It's hard to go to war against people when they're your wife's family. Now, some of you guys try that every once in a while, but it usually doesn't end very well. Um, Samson is becoming way too comfortable with the people that he's supposed to be defeating. And when he goes to mom and dad to talk about the fact that he's met this Philistine girl, his parents are adamantly opposed. You see what they say, their response in, in verse 3. His mom and dad say to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives? By the way, that's not incredibly weird. They're talking about uh, some extended family type things here. Or among all of our people, all the Israelites, that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Now, you may read that and you may read it nicely. That you must go take a wife from these uncircumcised Philistines? But that's not what they're saying. They are adamantly opposed. Really? They say, this girl of all people. Wh why, not, why not somebody who's like us? Why not somebody who's, who's a part of our people? Can't you find a nice Jewish girl? We'll help you. You'll be much better off and you'll be much happier. And he would have been. But then we see what Samson said. In verse 3, he says to his father, get her for me. That's the kind of thing that would make us knock our kids across the room if we did that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing where mom and dad have become really weak. And I know Samson is strong, but Samson is also very strong-willed. Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Samson's response tells us just about everything that we know, need to know about him. And it tells us just about everything that we need to know about the Israelites, because he's just a picture of what they're doing. In the New American Standard Version of the Bible, Samson says to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. The English Standard Version that I read from says she's right in my eyes. You remember at the beginning of the story, if you look back at chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Samson is a perfect reflection of the people of Israel, and they're a perfect reflection of him. He is ruled by the impulse of wanting to have this beautiful Philistine woman for his own. He refuses to listen to his parents, and so he's unteachable. He just thinks about what he feels and about what looks good in his eyes and could care less about what looks good or what looks right in God's eyes. And suffering comes because of it ends up, and we'll, we'll study that this passage more, but it ends up what happens is Samson becomes prideful and he tells this riddle and tells these, these Philistine men, if you, if you can figure out the riddle, I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you, you know, this new wardrobe. And so they go to his wife and they get her to tell him what's going on. Really, she's more like in our way of thinking, she's more like a fiance because they've, the marriage hasn't been finalized yet. And so she gets Samson to tell her the answer to the riddle. She passes it along to the other Philistines who Samson has challenged. And so Samson goes out, he kills a bunch of people, brings their clothes. Then while he's gone, this girl's dad marries her off to his best friend. So now Samson doesn't have a wife, he's angry, he catches a bunch of foxes, I don't even know how you do this, he ties their tails together, because that's what you do, and when you're mad you tie foxes' tails together, he puts a torch in their tails and sends them off running through the fields of the Philistines, lights all their fields on fire, so now they're out of food. So then they come after him, so he kills a thousand more of them. 
he ends up heartbroken partly because of his pride and partly because the Philistines would only ever see him as a foolish backwoods hick. His fiance marries his best friend. Samson's broken. He's angry. He suffers. The Philistines suffer. The Israelites suffer. And it all could have been avoided. See, Samson violated a biblical principle that's spoken about in the Old and New Testament. And I hope, man, I hope and I pray today that you will hang with me and hear me out. That principle and instruction is that God's people are only to marry God's people. Jews are to marry Jews. Christians are to marry Christians. The New Testament refers to intermarriage, what we would call intermarriage when a non-Jew marries a Jew or when a, a Christian marries a non-Christian. It, it refers to that as being unequally yoked. And we're going to explore that principle and we're going we're gonna to see why it exists and what we should do. And Samson's story of this, this crazy, impulsive, unteachable man shows us the importance of what God has laid out for. So here's the biblical background. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16a. It's the first part of 16. So uh, I think these are in your, in your bulletin. Is that right? The verses are in your bulletin? Okay. That way you can go back and look at them later. It says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? And what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are temples of the living God. The New Testament is where we get that phrase unequally yoked from. It's the idea of two work animals. One that's strong and one that's weak who are put together. And the idea is that when you put a strong animal next to a weak animal, we would think that that would make sense. Because they would kind of balance each other out. And we refer to, to that idea in marriage a lot. Like we fill in the gaps for each other. Maybe you've heard that. Uh, maybe you've even seen the example. That's why we, we hold hands like this. We quit doing that when we get married. But uh, not really. Uh, so we fill in the gaps for one another. It, it, our, our areas of strength fills in areas of weakness for other people, you've probably heard that before. And, and we would think that when you put like two oxen together, that, that a, a strong oxen would balance out the weakness of a weak one, but it doesn't work that way. What ends up happening is that the weak oxen ends up being like an axle that the strong oxen just wants to turn circles around. So that as they're pulling, the weak oxen doesn't pull as much as the strong one does, so they get going at different speeds and eventually they start turning and you can't plow in a straight line. Now to us, it doesn't make a lot of sense because we don't, we don't use oxen and we don't use plows and things like that. I don't even know, like I have to read to learn this stuff, okay? But we think about it like a flat tire on a, on a, on a, uh, I rode a four-wheeler this week, so let's imagine that we have a flat tire on the front wheel of a four-wheeler. It's always going to want to pull to that side. The handlebars are going to be constantly pulling that way, and so you have to work harder to get that going in a straight line to go where you need to go, and that's the idea. And Paul doesn't mean this in a judgmental way. He doesn't mean this in a mean way, but he's just, just affirming and repeating this Old Testament instruction that's pretty straightforward talks about it in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mighty than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not, here it is, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. The instruction is that when the Israelites get into the promised land, which is where they are in the book of Judges, that, that they're only to marry other Israelites. They're not under any circumstances to marry the people who live there. 
the instruction doesn't specifically mention the Philistines, but the principle that it lays out certainly applies. It would have excluded the Philistines as marriage material for good Jewish boys and girls. God intends for His people to have their closest relationships be with one another. And the closest relationship that you'll ever have is with your spouse in marriage. Students, I hope and I pray that this word sinks deep into your heart. More than you need anything else in a spouse, you need a spouse who will love Jesus more than anyone and anything else, including you. You need a spouse who loves Jesus more than they love you. Because if they don't love Jesus more than they love you, they will never be able to love you the way that Jesus loves you. When we love Jesus first and most, our capacity to love grows exponentially. So, hear this truth, students. If you're going to attract that kind of mate, if you're going to attract that kind of person, you have to be that kind of person. You have to become what you're looking for in a spouse. And to attract that kind of mate, you have to look in the right places. You will not find that kind of person in a bar or at weekend beer parties. You might find a spouse, but they'll come with baggage, with heartache and pain like Samson. So don't go looking in Timnah for a Philistine. Be a godly person and look in the places where godly people are. You might feel lonely. You might think, all my friends are dating. You might feel like the only one who's not in a relationship. But hear another truth. One that Samson would have been better off if he had learned. It's better to be with nobody than it is to be with the wrong body. So it's better to not have a person than to have the wrong person. Husbands and wives, regardless of whether you've been married for five years or 500 years, it's, it's not too late. You want to be the best husband that you can be or the best wife that you can be. You must, if you want that, you must love Jesus more than you love your spouse. I got that advice when Lindsay and I got engaged from an art professor at, at the college that we went to, and I thought he was nuts. He said, you've got to love Jesus more than you love her. And I thought, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. He must be an art professor. He's crazy. And then I found out, man, this guy is so incredibly smart. Like, he gets it. You want to be a better spouse? Make some changes in your priorities. You want to have a better spouse? Then make some changes in your own priorities. Change your perspective. And your spouse might change because you've changed. You set out to change them. How's that work? Lots of you have been married way longer than I have. It doesn't work when you try to change them. What works far better is when you change you. And that sparks change in them. So, so what's the danger in this? What's, what's the problem? What, I, I mean, we say all these things like, like uh, you, you need to marry only someone who loves Jesus more than they love you. Uh, to attract that kind of mate, you've got to be that kind of mate. To, to, to attract that kind of mate, you've got to look in the right places. It's better to be with nobody than with the wrong body. What's the danger if we say, well, this biblical principle isn't that big a deal. Exodus chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. God says to his people, observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out all those same people. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land in which you go. Lest it become a snare in your midst. Tear down their altars and break the pillars and cut down their, the ashram. These, those are the poles that these people are worshiping alongside Baal. He says, for, your, for you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, 
whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when they, when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And you're invited, you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of their daughters for your sons. And their daughters whore after their gods. And make your sons whore after their gods. What does this mean? A lot of people might think, and I don't want you to hear me say today, what a lot of people think, that the spouse might make you walk away from your faith. Because that's easy to defend. The reality is lots of Christians are married to unbelieving spouses, and they don't, they don't walk away, and their spouses don't even ask them to walk away from their faith. So is that really the danger? No, that's not the danger. The danger is they may not keep you from following Jesus, but they don't help you follow Jesus. And so that hurts you in following Jesus. God's teaching us that what we need in a spouse is someone who's going to actively encourage us and challenge us to follow after Jesus more. You want to be a good spouse? Do that. By the way, this is something that we haven't even had a chance to talk about, but I've been confronted with that this week. Like, how, am I, how am I encouraging Lindsay to follow after Jesus more? How am I spurring her on to, to love Jesus more and to pursue Jesus more? That's what this is about. Now, don't misunderstand. This is about religion. And not about race. This is about religion. And not about race. Nowhere in the Bible. Is there any indication. That lighter skinned and darker skinned individuals. Can't be in a relationship with each other. You can justify that. In that view. In a lot of ways. But the Bible does not divide people by race. At all. When it talks about Canaanites and Hittites. And Perizzites and Hivites and Jebusites. And and Philistines and all these other people. It is not talking about race. It's talking about religion. It's talking about faith. It is impossible to defend the position of racism. Or of dividing races. By not mixing in marriage from the Bible. It doesn't talk about it anywhere. That's not what God is talking about. Unequally yoked has nothing to do with race. It's about a difference in priority. It's about a couple being able to agree on what is going to be their most important priority in their family. And it's really hard for, Christian, for a Christian and a non-Christian to, to agree on the priority of faith. It's just hard because one person, the Christian, hopefully is prioritizing faith, or we're supposed to, and the non-Christian hasn't placed their faith in Christ, so it's, we, just, we have our faith in different places. So it's a different priority. So this is about a difference in priority, but it's not, it is not a justification for a divorce. The Bible does not allow us to divorce because we made a mistake by marrying a non-believer. We can't wake up one day and say, well, I want to prioritize following Jesus, so God is calling me to divorce my spouse so I can do that. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's never going to do that. God will never tell you, because you married a non-believer, you need to get a divorce. He's not going to do that. I can prove to you that he's not going to do that, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 13, he says, if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he shall not divorce her. So don't do it. If any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, he wants to continue in marriage, she should not divorce him. And then he says something that's incredibly hard for us to wrap our minds around. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Now Paul isn't telling us that the unbelieving spouse will go to heaven just because their, their spouse was a Christian. He's saying that the witness and the conduct of the believing spouse has the opportunity to show the truth of the gospel to their unbelieving spouse and to lead them toward Jesus. The point is, you can't say, well, this is about race. 
or that this is a justification for me to get a divorce. It's not what it is. But we also can't say, well, and here's the, here's the way I describe this. Well, God, God has different plans. For, I know what the Bible says, but God has different plans for me. And look what God says in Judges chapter 14, verse 4. It says, Samson's father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord. So, even though the Bible says that we shouldn't do this, it's okay if we do it sometimes. But understand what's taking place. God does plan for this to happen. God does have a purpose in this marriage. But it's for judgment and not for blessing. You can say, well, you know, uh, it, it would be possible to read this and say, well, Manoa and Mrs. Manoa, because we don't know her name, remember? Her name's just Mrs. Manoa. Um, Manoa and Mrs. Manoma, Manoa were wrong, and there are exceptions to the principle, and that would be great if this was about blessing. But no good comes of this relationship for the people involved, only pain. Samson's betrayed. The girl and her father, by the way, both are killed. The Philistine crops are destroyed. A thousand Philistines die at Samson's hands. If you want to use this as a justification for God's plan, well, my boyfriend and girlfriend and I are the exception to the rule, just like Samson. Then you better be ready to embrace the suffering that happened in this story too. I won't guarantee you that suffering will come. I know lots of people who, on the outside anyway, seem okay. But can you guarantee that suffering won't come? So what should I do if I'm married to an unbeliever? Number one, you love them faithfully and you model the love of Jesus to them. You love them faithfully and you model the love of Jesus to them. You be good to them. You be the best spouse on this planet to your husband, to your wife. You be kind to them, and you love them, and you serve them like Jesus. Second, you pray for their salvation. Pray that God would do what only God can do, that He would convince them of the truth and convict them of their sin and lead them to faith in Him. Pray that God would do that. Third, speak truth when you have the opportunity. Don't preach at them. The truth is, you probably don't have to because they already know What's a priority to you? But you can say things without preaching to people. By the way, preaching to people isn't the worst thing in the world. I hope. But make sure when you do speak to them about Jesus that you speak to them with the love of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus, not with pride and arrogance. Speak the truth when you have an opportunity. And fourth, remain faithful to Christ no matter what person you're married to, if they're not a believer, may, may be won over by your words, but the principle that the Bible presents to us, the teaching of the Bible, is that they're far more likely to be won over by your, your life and your love of Jesus, because they already know what you're going to say. So, there it is. That's hard. That's hard for me to talk about. It's hard for us to it's hard for us to hear at times. I know it's hard. But I, man, I hope gosh, I hope you hear my heart in this. This is not about me being prideful or saying that I've got it all together or, or we've got it all together. Trust me. We don't have it all together. If you're looking for a perfect marriage, don't look at my house. One of us has it pretty well together. And it ain't me. But this is God's plan. And it is good. Maybe today you're here and you're an unbelieving spouse. You're not yet a Christian. I, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm thankful that you're here 
And I hope and I pray you have not heard me be a nerd today. My hope and my prayer is that you would hear, hear the heart of God. If, if you're here with your spouse, you, 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 I would guess you want to be a good spouse to them. The best place to start is not by washing the laundry or helping with dishes or doing other chores around the house. The best way to be a better spouse is to love Jesus more. Maybe today you need to begin that relationship with Jesus. Maybe today you say, you know what? I've done everything that I can do. I've tried so hard to love my spouse more and I need help. I can give you pointers, but the first place I'm going to point you is toward Jesus. You've got to love Jesus. You've got to follow Jesus. That's the specific application and where we'll spend most of our time this morning, but there's two very short things that I want us to talk about too. Because it's pretty easy for us that are married to other Christians to go, ah, we got it all together. The first more broad application is that people can't become, God's people can't become partners with the world. The church cannot allow its priority to be shifted from worshiping God alone. We cannot compromise our teaching that salvation is available through faith in Christ alone. The church cannot allow the culture around us to dictate what we believe and what we practice and what we preach. Because that's the church marrying Philistine girls. That's the church being unequally yoked. The Bible teaches us that we must believe and practice and preach certain things. And the Bible alone is our standard, which teaches us the second broad application. God's people cannot compromise with the word. The Bible must be our sole basis for what we believe and what we teach. The Bible instructs us and shapes us and teaches us and changes us. And we must believe this book. We must believe this book. And we must teach this book. We must know this book. And we must live this book. We can't become partners with the world. We can't compromise with the world. Here's my question for you today. We talked about this yoke thing. Are you yoked to Jesus? Really what a yoke is, it's, I wish I had a picture, but I didn't even think of putting it up there. A yoke is this long piece of wood that's carved to go over the shoulders of two animals. So it, it's carved, it starts out low, it comes up, and then in the middle it comes back down. And it's got these connections that go under the neck, the brisket area of an animal, the, the chest. And it ties these two animals together so that when they're in that yoke, they're connected with one another and they have to go in the same direction. They can't not go in the same direction. The one has to go with the other. They, they have to go together. So here's my question. Are you yoked to Jesus? Like, Are you connected to Jesus so that where he goes, you will go? And when he puts on the brakes, you stop. Chris Tomlin sang this song, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Are you yoked to Jesus? Are you connected to Jesus? Are you in relationship with Jesus? If you're not a Christian today, that's where you start. You start by connecting with Jesus and beginning a relationship with God through Jesus today. You ask Him to remove your sin. You ask Him to give you a relationship and you, you commit to following Him forever. And if you will do that, the Bible guarantees that the yoke goes on. But the good news is, Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Will you be yoked to Jesus today?
Will you begin that relationship? Will you commit to following Jesus today? And if you are a Christian, you say, I'm already yoked to Jesus. What do I do? You start loving Him more. You grow in your relationship with Jesus by taking a step of obedience. Maybe it's baptism or, or church membership. You say, you know, I've, I've been coming to church here for 27 years, but I've never taken that step. Why not? What are you waiting for? I suggest you wait for God, but if He's telling you to take a step, take the step. Be obedient. Maybe you need to get to know other Christians and grow alongside other Christians in your relationship with God through a Bible study or a Sunday school class. Maybe you need to grow in your relationship with God by serving other people, which doesn't seem like it would happen that way, but it happens that way. When you serve other people and you share the love of Jesus, you grow in your relationship with God. Because Jesus served people. And when you serve, you become more like Jesus. Maybe you need to begin reading the Bible on your own. You say, where do I start? It's a big book. Well, there's two Bible reading plans on your way out the door today. They're underneath the big wooden map on the wall. Uh, so you just pick one of those up and you start reading. And you, when you get done, check it off. Just check the area off. That's a, that's a great way to grow in your relationship with God. Through reading and studying and memorizing the Bible through giving and praying. There's so many things that you can do. I'd love to talk with you about that, but the last way that you can grow in your relationship with God is by telling other people what God has done for you through Jesus. And so today, if you, maybe you know someone, maybe it's a friend or a family member, and you say, you know what? I haven't been doing a good job of displaying God to them, but I also haven't been a good, done a good job of speaking the word of God to them. And I want to pray today that God would give me the strength and the courage to do that. We want to give you that opportunity. Maybe today there's some other area in your life where you've been disobedient. You've been wondering. God's been telling you to do something and you just have been ignoring what he said. But today you say, you know what? Today I'm going to follow Jesus. We want to give you that opportunity as well. So our musicians are going to come. They're going to lead us in one uh, last song today. And if you have a decision that you need to make today, maybe it's by becoming yoked to Jesus, connecting to Jesus for the first time today. Or maybe it's in some other area. We want to give you the opportunity to respond. Jacob and I will be waiting at the front to talk with you and pray with you. Or you can come and pray on your own. Maybe you want to grab somebody sitting next to you and ask them to come and pray with you too. That's great. But we want to give you an opportunity to respond. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll have our time of invitation. Father, we... We love you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you've given Jesus for us so that we can know you and love you and have a relationship with you. And we pray today, Father, that if there's one here uh, who doesn't have a relationship with you yet, that today would be the day that they trust you for the first time. And if there's one today, Father, who, who does know you, but they need to take a step to grow in their relationship with you, I pray that you would do that. For the one here today, God, who who is weak in their faith or who is wondering whether they are even in relationship with you today. God, I pray that you would show them and reveal to them right now. That you would give them confidence that they are in you. God, help us to follow you in whatever you have for us. Help us to know. Help us to have strength to step out and follow. We ask it in Jesus' name.